That's two straight finishes. She hasn't lost at 135 pounds. In this division, I mean, nobody finish, 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 finish. I am like Charles de Bronx. Mayra Chitara Bueno Silva! That's the statement that he was looking to make and he could not have done it any better. I know how hard I hit. I know how good of a striker I am. I know hard decisions, but I know people help. <laughs> Arnold Almighty Allen, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to UFC Unfiltered. Please tell me that's on video. I've never been happier. I'm made for a fucking podcast. That's <laughs> dangerous. Listen to me, we're at it. All right. Well, hi, John. Uh, Matt's away today. Uh, thanks for joining and filling in. How you doing? I'm good, man. I mean, I know uh, to try to fill in for Matt Sarah is an absolute impossibility. I don't think anybody's going to bring that type of energy to the table, but uh, we'll do the best we can today. It is weird. Matt is a uh, he's a freight train. And if you know Henzo, he's very much the same way. Like they're just these balls of energy um but it's always a focused energy like uh when they're talking about something they're intensely and they're both very captivating guys like i've seen henzo in the gym when he was promoting someone and there's just a room full of people and he's being fucking hilarious and comfortable and that's kind of how matt is you know a hundred percent just an absolute force of nature but uh the sincerity is there when you talk about both those guys with matt and henzo like you know they're not bullshitting you you know what i mean it's sincere and it it makes you care like you said it's captivating gets your attention so matt sarah is a legend so i would never pretend to take his place i will just sit in the chair briefly for a day well matt is uh there's the thing about matt too and i, I talked about this recently there's no lying in matt like he, he's not he couldn't i don't think lie if he wanted to it's just he's too honest uh, he's emotionally honest uh he just can't hide it so he's very you always know exactly where you stand with him um and he's with dana right now and dean thomas fucking around in uh toronto doing looking for a fight oh look at that he's getting the nice choice assignment although it's a little chilly up there in toronto these days uh usc 297 fight week looking a little cold out there but i'm sure they'll they'll have a great time but yeah to your point i do want to say that is an amazing quality in any human being and matt sarah has it just be honest i mean you know look sean strickland maybe a little brutally honest sometimes maybe he says some things people don't want to hear but honestly i'd rather just know where i stand and what you think on something than to try to bs somebody and play a game just let people know where they stand no one has ever said Hey, I met Sean Strickland. I wonder where I stand with him. You know immediately. There's no pretending. And again, some guys are just too emotionally truthful and they can't hide it even if they wanted. Um, what do you think of Sean against Drake is Duplessy uh, as, as the uh, the main event at 297? Um, I mean, again, nobody expected him to do what he did to Izzy. Um, what do you think about him against Drake is? It's so wild, right? Because this this whole middleweight division went down a path that we weren't expecting, right? I mean, all this buildup was to Israel Adesanya and Drinkus Duplessis and the the intense rivalry they had and and the pride of Africa and all these things. And that's what we thought we were building to. And then Sean Strickland came in here and just spoiled the party, man, and put on a masterful performance against Israel Adesanya. And now I'll be honest with you, Jim, I'm as excited as this fight as I am for anything on the calendar right now, just because I think a little bit of the unpredictability of it, a little bit of the way the styles match up. I mean, I don't think either one of these guys is backing down. They've they've both been aggressive. I mean, they had round one in the crowd at T-Mobile Arena just to get you a little extra fired up about it. And, you know, I think this fight week is, is going to continue to play out and, and, and add some flavor to it. But it's an intriguing matchup, man. This, to me, is like a 50-50 fight. And those, to me are my favorite kind of fights. I mean, MMA, you yeah. never know for sure. And that's right. what's awesome, right? You never know for sure. But when you really look at a fight and you're just like, man, this thing is 50-50 to me, that excites me. And that's what I feel we've got here. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's one of those things where I, I think the thing I was most impressed with was Strickland over Izzy. And I, and I don't remember if we talked about this. I know I talked about it with Matt, uh, but it was round three. And that was the thing. And, and we may have discussed that already, but it was round one. All right, he had a great round. Uh, if I remember right, he almost finished him. Round right. two, Adesanya won. He was uh, you're like, oh, here it comes. And then for, for uh, Strickland to be able to stop that momentum in round three and then impose his will, it was, it's fucking amazing. Um, and I hope, I'm sure people who watch a lot of fights recognize that. But that to me was as impressive as the win, was that round three. 
Uh, I felt that was even more impressive than what he did at the end of round one. Yeah, that's a solid observation, man, because as you said, you know, when things start to shift the way, okay, yeah, here's what we thought we were going to say. And for you to dig deep within yourself and say, no, we're not going to. And I, I mean, it just really was a, a mature performance. And knowing, you know, Sean knew that everybody was doubting him, that nobody was giving him a chance, but, you know, his team did. And gosh, man, the leadership of Eric Nixick, I mean, you can't say enough about that and, and, the, and the type of emotions and, and, and the psychology that he brings to the table. And yeah, man, it was just a great performance. And listen, I, I think it's one of those performances too i think it's real easy for maybe people to step back and say yeah but i don't know did israel had asanya really have a, a good night that night or was it an off night and maybe it wasn't maybe it wasn't his best stuff but you can't take away from sean strickland you can't chalk it all up to oh well izzy had a bad night so sean just got lucky he put in the work and it all paid off on that night and it was i thought it was a beautiful moment to see really for him to be crowned champion yeah, and I think that sometimes somebody has a bad night because of what their opponent is doing. And, and uh, he said something in between rounds about how I can't get my jab. Well, he complained about something that Strickland was doing, which was frustrating him. So he may have, maybe he was a little off, but I think that he had a bad night primarily because uh, Strickland was really frustrating him and, and just putting so much pressure on him. And I think Strickland caused that shitty night. I, I think you're 100% right. And, I, you know, the other lasting image that fight for me will be, you know, obviously Sean Strickland doesn't go sit down in the corner, but they're like having to like corral him back to the edge of the cage to even talk to him. Like he's like, no, I'm in the center. Let's go. We're not stopping this thing. Let's go. And I don't know, man. I thought it was an amazing performance. And look, I think he's going to need a similarly amazing performance on Saturday night, albeit in a much different style, right? Because Drickus Duplassi brings something entirely different to the table. Mm -hmm. It's not that he's going to bring that, you know, beautiful style and master of movement and master of distance and range. Like, no, he's going to bring sheer unbridled aggression. He's got that wild timing, you know, kind of does everything on the offbeat. It looks kind of awkward, but it's so effective. And uh, I think we're going to have a fun fight on Saturday night. Yeah, and I think he's 6-0, and oh, if I'm looking here. Uh, looks like 6-0 and oh in the UFC, and five of the six are stoppages, and the only decision is Tavares, who, uh, I, I mean, he could probably go the distance with anybody. I think the first time I saw uh, Izzy fight, with, like in person, like the first time I was at an Izzy fight, if I remember correctly, was uh, him and Tavares on a Thursday night uh, fight night, I think it was, but uh, and, he, and, and he went the distance. So, yeah, Duplessis has been, uh, I mean, TKOs, uh, and who did he sub? Uh, Darren Tilly submitted, but not that Till is known for his amazing ground game but still um very very impressive so far in the ufc whitaker brunson i mean he's knocking out guys that are really just typically not uh, easily stopped no not at all that's as you said brad tavares i mean the, the veteran that he is and how long he's been around and what he brings to catch but listen i see a lot of people in the same way that a lot of people are kind of doubting sean strickland i see people yeah. doubting drickus as well by saying yeah but darren till where was he at in his career at that moment ah Derek brunson he was kind of on his way out so where was he Robert Whitaker, I saw a report come out this week that Robert Whitaker begrudgingly kind of said, yeah, I, I did have an injury. I don't want to talk about it because I don't make excuses. That's not me, but I probably shouldn't have had that fight that night. Um, and so now people are saying, well, that amazing win over Robert Whitaker, where everybody said, now this guy's a title challenger. Maybe that didn't mean things. So that's why I just think there's so much at stake here. So many question marks and why I think it is kind of a 50-50 type fight it, again. And then you add the way their styles match up as well. I, I just, I love this one on paper. And Brunson before that, even though he did lose to uh, Cannoneer uh, before he lost to Duplessis, but he had beaten Till, he had beaten Kevin Holland, Shabazi, and I think he handed him his first loss when he was, I, I want to say, 10-0 or 11-0. Uh, Ian Heinish, so he wasn't, uh, Elias Doro, he, he, Theodoro, he wasn't fighting a, a shitty fight, he was fighting really good fighters, and, and Brunson looked great for a while. I mean, getting older, I mean, he's like, was he 38 now, 39? Yeah. Uh, I was really hoping for a title shot, because I love Derek Brunson. Um but, you know, I think that Duplessis uh, loss may have really set him back a little bit. Um, it looks like now, uh, oh, oh uh, Myra Bueno Silva is in the waiting room fighting Raquel Pennington for that vacated belt in the co-main on Saturday. Really, really interesting. And Raquel um, has looked really good since that. Uh, did she fight again after that Amanda loss? She had, I think she had two straight losses, if I remember correctly. Was it Holly she lost to? Yeah. Um, why don't I just look at the sheet instead of fucking guessing? Um, <laughs> Um, let's bring in uh, let's bring in Myra right now. How are you? Good and you? Uh, very good. Um, and, and how do you feel about this uh, this this shot for the vacated belt? Um, and and uh, how did you find out you were getting this? 
I'm feeling great uh, about everything. I'm ready for to take my belt. This belt now is my belt. Good. Uh, do you feel better knowing? I, I thought it was very unfair uh, what they did after the Holly Home fight. I thought that was unfair. Um, they should not have taken that from you. Um, but do you feel better now knowing that you're okay and you don't have to worry about that anymore with the medication? Uh, I think everything happening for me help another person stay the same, the same, the same place with me. I think uh, for me help other people now need help in the mental health. So you are comfortable. I like that you're comfortable being very open uh, and letting your struggles kind of help somebody else because we all deal with things. And it's, it, to hear a fighter so strong talking about having uh, issues, you know that that helps a lot of people. Yeah, of course. I can't. Everybody need the help one moment in your life. Uh, I'm here for help because I can do. I can't talk about this because I stay in this in this this place. Yes. Uh, and John, I don't want to, if you wanted to, if there's something you wanted to ask, I don't want to just feel free, please. Yeah, absolutely. My, I, I was just curious maybe how challenging this has been with people maybe not giving the title the respect it deserves because Amanda Nunes walked away, but this is a UFC title fight. And I feel like maybe people aren't giving you to the respect that you deserve in this moment. Has that been challenging for you to maybe not receive the respect you think you deserve in a UFC title fight? No, I, I feel you know, uh, everything's happening. Uh, when I knock her out, when I win, I take my belt. Everybody go to the homes, talk about me. And then my next fight is different. What it's going to be different. Oh, gotcha. you, let, me, let me ask as well, as I say, because we know what is next after this fight, right? Is Juliana Pena, who's been out there talking a lot. And I just wonder how much of a struggle it's been to focus on Raquel Pennington, right? Because she's a durable fighter, a great athlete. You know there's a matchup with Juliana Pena, but how hard has it been to not think about Juliana Pena and to just stay centered on this matchup? Man, when I win Raquel, everything is more easy because Raquel is tough, but Juliana, easy money. Easy money. Um, also, you know, Raquel, after that loss to Amanda, she, uh, she, she lost to Jermaine. And then she has won six out of her seven last fights. She's looked really, really good since that, uh, that loss. She did lose a decision to Holly. What do you think that she has changed? Or what have you noticed different in her since those two losses? I think she improved her, mi her mind and her mentality. And because she fights like, like the same fights, the, the same things. But I think she improved her mind. Her mind. <laughs> How have you handled, you handle the pressure so well. You, you, you have not been in the UFC that long and already you've made evented, you're fighting for the title. Um, has it been a, a, a struggle for you with the, with, with the, uh, the, the pressure, the all of a sudden pressure? You seem to be doing very well with it. Man, everything is happening in my life because God bless me. God bless me too much. So you feel blessed and you don't worry about the, you know, you don't worry about the pressure because you feel like this is all part of how it's supposed to be. No, I feel the pressure. If, if you want person to talk about it, don't feel pressure. It's, it's bullshit. Everybody <laughs> feel pressure. It's bullshit. But I support this pressure because God bless me. And then I am the chosen one. I prove for everybody that I am the chosen one. Do you visualize things? Some fighters visualize the entire fight before it happens and go through it in their minds and uh, picture themselves with the belt. How do you approach a fight mentally? Do you, do you go through it like that and, and picture everything that might happen or how do you deal with that? I always do this, but this time is different. Uh, I think about the other things. I'm nervous about the other things, not about the fight, not about Raquel, but about uh, the fight, about the first conference, you know, because they're my first time that, but uh, I feel great. I feel great about that. So you're, you're not, the nerves are not as much about the fight as they are about the spotlight from the other things being the co-main event. Yeah, exactly. I think in the Saturday, I'm staying more nervous because of the fight, but now I'm, I, I, I just uh, enjoy the process. 
I think that's a good thing because it's something else to focus on because you've done your training. You're not going to train more in the next three days. So for your mind to be on something else, it might actually be a good way to handle the nerves, having other things so you don't uh, overthink the fight, so you don't over-obsess about the fight. Exactly. I have a lot of things before the fight. I have cut weight. I have uh, conference. I have face-to-face. And then fight on Saturday. Saturday, I think about the fight. Jim, let me jump in real quick. Sure, sure, John. Mara, I was going to ask you, I mean, Alexander Pantoja, obviously, you've got a, a lot of people in America and top team you could pull from but man what he's had this year what he's gone how much have you sought attention or advice from him I should say and what what has he had to say to you this week he helped me too much man I go I go I go the fight that, that was when you fight I go to the fight I see everything I imagine in my 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 moment I I feel everything he told me hey look everything's it's, it's happening with you and then enjoy now but folks in your fight, when it happens with you, you stay more relaxed. Exactly, is the, the stay, exactly like I'm feel now. That's awesome. He's great advice. And it's funny because I'm telling you, you need to stay focused on this fight. But I do have to wonder, sounds like the UFC going back to Brazil in May uh, as a champion, maybe the easy money fight with Juliana Pena in Brazil. Do you see that as a goal, as a possibility? I love this idea. I love this idea. And with someone like Juliana, who you have, you don't like what she said. Uh, you don't like the comments she made. Are you able, is it hard for you to separate that in the cage? Like to not fight emotionally, to not let yourself, uh, you know, we saw the best case example would obviously be uh, Jose against Connor, allowing emotion to kind of dictate a mistake. Uh, and some fighters try to use that to get their opponent to make a mistake. Uh, is that something that you, uh, are aware of and conscious of and careful of? No, I, I like separate. I, I know like separate the things. Uh, when I will, I, I go, I will fight with her. I will use this for guys for me train more hard, train more. But when you go fight, everything change. Right, you don't allow it to to interfere uh, and get too emotional in the cage and and cause you to make errors. Exactly. I, I will show you for her who is Chitara. Well, Myra, can, congratulations on getting this shot. It, it's a great fight and the co-main event. Um, it'll be very interesting to see as well uh, how Raquel responds, um, you know, you know, to getting this, uh, this shot. Number two against number three. Uh, you, you both uh, deserve this. And uh, if you win, I really would love to see that Pena fight in, in Brazil. But uh Good luck with Raquel first. I know you got to get through that and good luck fight. I hope, I hope you do well and have a great fight. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you again. I know that fighters, especially cutting weight, uh, are always like, you know, you, you try to you have them for a few minutes and don't, you know, but, oh yeah, John, feel free to jump in by the way. Like, please don't wait for me. Just, just pop in whenever you want. You got it, man. I appreciate it. No, no, it's, it's great. You know, listen, this this is an interesting title fight as well because, uh, well, first of all, props to her for doing an interview in her second language. I mean, she's. I, I always applaud yeah. fighters. They'll do that. I know it sounds kind of bad to say, like, you should speak English. Maybe we should speak Portuguese, but let's just be on it. The, the, the majority of the audience is, is here in the United States, especially the pay-per-view buying yeah. audience. So if you can communicate with them, it's great. But I feel kind of bad for these two ladies because, you know, and this, this happens. When a champion walks away and right. then you have two people fill in to fight for that title, you know, the, right away it kind of feels like, yeah, but they weren't, you know, they weren't the ones. They're only fighting because the champion walked away. But And it's unfortunate that that's the way this played out. And, and I hope that, you know, whoever is victorious here can start making a charge and start erasing that. Cause it just takes a, you know, a couple of extra results, a couple extra wins to, for people to put that mindset away, but it's challenging right now because I don't think they're getting the respect they deserve for this fight. But as she said, Hey man, you go out here and you get a big knockout. Then you go out there and you deal with Juliana Pena. And maybe if they can do that fight in Brazil, I mean, n- now you start changing the perception a little bit. So big opportunities there. Yeah, it, it is one of those things where, but but again, especially when somebody like Amanda Nunes, who was so dominant for so long, it's not somebody who just had the belt like when uh, Yuri Prohaska uh, vacated it because of uh, an injury. Like, yeah, all right, he's a great fighter, but he had like what, what he he had the I don't even think he had defended at that point. It, right. It's it's a different tone to then when someone so dominant walks away. 
But again, nobody ducked Amanda. I mean, uh, no. Raquel did fight her. She just, Amanda was done. Um, I hated that she retired because I enjoyed watching her fight. But maybe she felt like, nah, this is, I've done enough. Enough. Yeah, I, I, I hated that she walked away, but I love the way she did it, man. I thought that was so cool to lay down two belts and to bring her kid into the cage and running around with a beer in there. I mean, what a scene that was. But you're right. I mean, it's funny. Like, you, you talk about pro wrestling. Pro wrestling, they always say, you know, you got to give the rub to the young guy. The old guy's got to put the young guy over because that's what happens. There's just this little vacuum where you go, well, I don't know. I don't know if they're really a deserving champion. So, look, it, I, I think, you know, a statement can be made on Saturday night, and then you start trying to link together defenses, and you start, you know, pe pecking away at that perception, so to speak. So it's a little bit of an uphill battle, but two athletes that, as you said, deserve to be in the fight. I mean, they're the ones at the top of the division. They're the ones that have gone on the win streak. They're the ones that have got the results. They deserve this opportunity. Yeah, and we also have Arnold Allen uh, coming on uh, shortly, fighting Mozart Ivloev. And he's a really, I, I, the stat I read today, I mean, I'm, I'm sure I, I watched so many of his fights, but I didn't realize he had not uh, had any stoppages since he's been in the UFC. Now, it doesn't mean anything. Um, you know, some, some people just fight to decision a lot, but you wonder if that goes into, uh, what does Arnold Allen think about that? Or any fighter fighting someone that hasn't stopped anybody, does that tell you like uh, anything about them? I don't even know what it would be. I'm not a fighter. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I mean, I, listen, I think everybody wants to get those finishes. Everybody wants to get those highlights. I mean, when you're competing at the highest level, that's easier said than done, right? When you're facing the absolute best in the world on the other side, that's difficult to do. You know, when you're when you're on the regional scene fighting overmatched, unqualified competition, it's a heck of a lot easier. But yeah, I think, you know, Arnold wants to make those statements, wants to get them. But it, it also says something about their character that they can push to the edge every single time. They can go all the way to the end and, and they're going to be the ones to get their hand raised. I mean, he had some dominant performances yeah. along the way. The exclamation points are nice. They really are. They add a little bit of something to the resume. But, man, the win streak that he had, I know I know he's coming off a loss. I know how frustrating that is. Um, but, man, it, you can't ignore that win streak he put together. 10-1 and in yeah. the UFC is incredible. Against incredible. guys like Calvin Cater, Dan Hooker, uh, Sadiq Youssef, Nick Land. I mean, he fought some really, really good. And, look, I mean, Frank Edgar had a – I don't know if he still has the record for most hours in the octagon or most minutes in the octagon – but it's like that as much as that gives you uh, such a high fight IQ and great experience, it also wears on you. I mean, uh, you know what I mean? Like it, it really fucking it wears on your body because, you know, you're still you know being taken down, taking people down, getting hit. hit. You know, it, adds, it, it takes away probably uh, a little bit of longevity. It's the hard part about the sport, right? Because the sport is so chaotic. Everything happens so fast in there, and you hear people talk about it. And over time, you get more comfortable in there. The, the fight slows down for you a little bit. You can think. You can hear your corner. You can hear those instructions. But as you said, as you continue to get better and better mentally, your body continues to get worse and worse physically. And so you just try to cross those paths somewhere at the right time to get you a title shot, get you the highest level of sport. But yeah, I mean, this is not a sport you can do forever, man. Your, your body just can't take it. So the faster you can get in there and get out, the, the, the better for self-preservation. But there is value in those you know, long fights sometimes just because you get comfortable in there. And whenever I talk about like fighting with emotion where it hurts you, I mean, Jose Conner is the most obvious and, and one of the biggest things. That, but I mean, uh, I mean, Paulo Costa, I think against Izzy, I mean, Izzy did kind of freeze him, but I think that he got a little bit psyched out before he went in there. I, I think that his head wasn't in the right space. Um, and if you could think of any other examples of guys, I was thinking that as we were talking, like, who else has gone in there? And I thought really, I thought Alvarez was overwhelmed uh, by that moment at MSG against Conor, but yeah. I don't necessarily mean that is not the same as fighting with emotion where as Jose was so fucking mad. He wanted to uh, get a quick knockout. I'm trying to think of other examples of that. Listen, jo Jose is always the, the perfect example to go to, but uh, I did think, man, I'll, I'll never forget. You know, uh, you said it right, man. Um, Conor McGregor is the master of that. I thought Eddie Alvarez was good all week long. And then at the press conference, he kind of lost it. You know what I mean? And, and then you, you look at the flip side. You know, I think about when uh, Nate Diaz knocked Cowboy Cerrone's head off back to the, the old school. You know, he knocked his hat off at the at the at the stare down, and that pissed him off. And then he went in with emotion he didn't need to have. I mean, there's examples of it along the way. But I think about the other side of it too. Remember, as dark as it was, as terrible as a fight week that was, but Habib and Connor. Remember at the press conference where Habib came out even before Dana White came out on the stage and said, "Look." Press conference is starting. Let's go. And he gave it like 15 minutes. Connor wasn't there. He got up and walked away. It was like, my time's done. So there is such a masterful thing to, to not allow yourself to kind of mentally fall into those traps. And it's weird because 
people may say, well, you want to, you want to have that extra fire. You want to have that extra adrenaline, but yeah, when you're going there emotional, like you said, and you're not really thinking things through and all you're trying to do is just hurt that guy versus really implement the game plan and do what you know is best. And Hey, we've worked on this. We know where the openings are. We know where the opportunities are going to be. Instead, you just come out there, you know, eyes red, looking to throw down. That can be very, that can be a very, very bad thing. I would love to ask Cormier. I wonder if he ever felt that way against Jones. Cause they, they had such, um, such a animosity at times between oh. them. Did that ever affect? It's hard to not let it like some guys are robotic and can just shut it. The fu- like for Habib not to get, uh, f- flustered, especially after the things Connor had said about his dad or about the whole bus. Like there was so much. Um, and the fact that I think Connor was a little better, uh, 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 uh on the floor than, than Habib planned. I, I mean, I think he probably thought he'd submit him in the first round. And the fact that I think it went to the fourth, if I remember correctly. Um, but yeah, it's, it's gotta be hard to not let that interfere. Has to be as professional as, as Daniel Cormier is, as, you know, experienced as he is. I mean, that was a blood feud rivalry. I mean, you think about obviously the the brawl in the MGM lobby. You think about you know that famous uh, you know exchange on the cameras where they were in the opposite rooms where yeah. he's like, I would literally kill you. Kill you. And, where they were go. Oh my gosh! I mean, that was blood feud. You know, who else used to be amazing at that. Michael Bisping used to get under people's skins tremendously. Yeah. He was so good at uh, just riling people up and again getting them to fight kind of out of character uh, and really they just want to hurt the guy and, and shut the guy up and uh, that that could be a weapon. That, that mental warfare is a weapon that you can use for your advantage. Chael Sonnen, too. Um, and I remember, I want to say it was after the second Anderson fight when he tried that spinning back fist and fell. Uh, if I remember right, he was doing very well in that first round. Was that the first round that happened or the second round? I don't remember. Early on, yeah. I mean, it, it was early in the fight. About how gr- great he did in the in the first fight. I mean, that was unbelievable. And to come out and do that, that was wild. But was that the mental warfare playing on the other side? What was the reasoning behind that, you know? Well, I remember Silva... Um, I think he cried after that fight. Like he was so overcome by emotion that he just, I, I think that fight meant so much to him because the humiliation of, uh, of, of the way Chael was taunting him to have lost to him, um, would, would have been too much. And it just seemed like if he was fighting with emotion, it, maybe it didn't affect his performance. But if I remember he was losing that first round, um, uh, yeah. but yeah, he lost all, I mean, it was the fifth that, that, uh, he caught Chael, but I, I think he had lost every round except for that moment like he, i'll i'll never forget I, I i had my i had my story basically written uh working cage side man because it was just like well nothing's changed in this fight and then it had to delete everything and start over when he got the miraculous come from behind finish man that was what a classic moment that was in ufc history and and it also i mean and, and you look at it, it's so funny chael because jones broke his toe when they fought uh in that i think in that first round and had he yep. had chael been able to yeah, easier said than done, but survive that first round, he would have been champion. Uh, and he missed light heavyweight championship and middleweight championship by like like very slim margins. Um, and he could have fought Silva, uh, Silva different in that fifth round and probably uh, just kind of kept him at bay and won that belt pretty easily. You know, it's funny. I just saw a clip from that recently pop up randomly on timeline that I had totally forgotten about. It was afterwards, Chael was like, you know, the problem was I misunderstood the rules. I thought if I tapped, I just lost that round, but then I would win the fight. And only Chael Sonnen could get away with that where you're like, dude, you are hilarious, man. The Chael, one of the greatest ever on the microphone, man. It obviously continues to be so to this day. Yeah, he he was. uh, And look, him going, you you can't just sit there and do nothing against Anderson and, and coast to a win. But I mean, the fact that he was being as aggressive as he was, uh, it was just it was just amazing. It just shows how much he really wanted to finish that fight and he wanted to just do as much damage as possible. But yeah, this, he was hilarious. Uh, and there was always something when you see guys trying to do what Chael was a master at, uh, a lot of guys are lacking something that he had because uh, there was something that made you love Chael, even though he would say things that made people furious. Uh, it felt genuine and it felt like this is who this guy is. Uh, but when people try to emulate that, a lot of times it looks really bad. Yeah, and it's been such a point of discussion lately, right? Like where where does the trash talk go and what's the line on it? And are there are there certain things you shouldn't talk about? But I think that's the biggest thing too. You know, hey, we started off the show talking about sincerity. I mean, I think there's some kind of sincerity in who you put out there as well. I mean, yes, there is a little, there's no question there's an entertainment side of fighting as well, yeah. right? It's not just what happens in the cage and the techniques, you know, it's the build up and the discussion. And, you know, like I said, the, the fact that Sean Strickland and Drinkus Duplessis had this, you know, altercation in the crowd where where Sean 
you know, peacefully asked Gilbert Burns' kids to step aside first before he jumped over. I mean, that yeah. stuff, you know, it's fun, but <laughs> there, there are, it, it's got to be sincere. You know what I mean? I think, I think there's got to be some form of sincerity to it. And Ch Chael was the master at it, man. If you're ever going to pattern yourself after somebody, and, and that, I think that's the, the key is don't necessarily pattern yourself after somebody. Right. Maybe find a voice that echoes your own and you could kind of emulate that. But like, don't, you're not going to be Conor McGregor. Like Conor McGregor is unbelievable once in a generation. Amazing. And, and if you try to do that, I just think it, it comes off poorly. And I think people see right through it. Yes. And we'll bring uh, Arnold Allen in right now. And, uh, and, and to your point about that, it's funny, even with Strickland who did uh, move the kids. He, but it, it, if you remember, I think it looked like he was punching him on the shoulder. Like he's not stupid. Like he wasn't trying to break his jaw and he wasn't trying to break his own hand on Duplessis, you know, fucking marble head. Um, so he did, he, he still had his wits about it. Hey Arnold, how you doing? What's up, buddy? I'm good, thanks, man. You? Ah, uh, very good, buddy. Thanks for joining us. Um, great, great fight. Uh, what, what do you think about, uh, Yves Loeb? And, and look, he's uh, undefeated in the UFC. And has fought some great fighters, but you have really fought uh, the the top fighters in the division. Um, and, and what do you think about uh, his record he's accumulated and and him as a fighter in general? Yeah, he's very good, very good. He's uh, undefeated for a reason. He's on a hot streak. You know, he's full of confidence, and uh, I'm sure he's coming to try and stake a claim for a title shot. But I'm gonna put my name back in that hat and get back to it. And how how would how are you doing after look uh, losses affect different people differently? I mean, most guys just move on from it. But you know, you lost to one of the greatest fighters. It was a good fight. And 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 how did you feel after that? And and how did you kind of get yourself situated again? Mm, yeah, it, it sucks. But you know, once to get back to training and uh, have a couple of weeks of uh, eating my feelings and being a bit sad about it, I'm back in the gym and uh, trying to fix those problems and get better. That's you know, I don't dwell on it. Do you allow yourself to feel even whether I've said you say you have a, a great win? Do you allow yourself to kind of relish in that for a while and feel great about it, or how long do you give yourself to kind of enjoy what you're doing before you stop the the sadness or the enjoyment and go fuck this? I have to get back to business. Yeah, like to be honest, as soon as you you win a fight, you know you you're thinking of the next task. As soon as you walk out the cage, the first thing people are asking you, who's next? What's next? Like, no one cares anymore. They want the next thing, so you can't you can't relish it too long but you can't eat food for a couple of weeks. <laughs> Arnold, I did want I mean, listen, every fighter would like to go out there and win every fight, right? Like nobody wants to lose. You get half your paycheck, you get set back. Yeah. I mean, it's not fun, right? But I don't know. Is there any benefit at all? Like there's, it seemed like there was pressure on you, this win streak and, you know, what you had to do. It's like people are talking more about that necessarily than where you stand, your skills. That's what I mean. Is there any benefit at all that at least, hey, we don't have to have that discussion anymore? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't know. It's the only question I've been asked like this whole media week is uh, about losing to Max Holloway. I've been asked more about that than I have about my opponent. So it's it's a weird feeling. But yeah, I, I, don't, know. I don't know. I'm I'm fully focused on this guy. I'm over that over that fight and uh, you know learn my lessons and gonna go back to the drawing board better and come back and prove I've improved. It's been and it's been nine months. I mean, you've had plenty of time to to do what you had to do and train. And how do you feel about quick turnaround fights? Like, uh, I mean, again, Volkanovski is a different human being. Uh, he's a different person, but he's uh, turning around relatively quickly after that uh, uh, Makachev uh, fight. And and how do you feel about quick turnarounds? Do you take kind of what they give you, or are there times where you like, I just no, I don't feel ready yet. I need some time. Yeah, I mean, it's it's got to be it's got to work for you, isn't it? If you're out of the gym not training and you're out of shape or, or you're injury injured like what's the point of taking a short notice you know unless unless it makes sense for you and you're ready to go you know sometimes guys are training all year round healthy ready to go if, if an opportunity comes up three four five weeks it's worthwhile but if you're coming up an injury and you're you're not feeling good then is, is there any point but yeah I, I don't like the quick turnaround for him to be honest uh, I have to get knocked out by Makachev straight back into the gym into a camp I, uh, I, i'm not a fan of it yeah you wonder when a person does that when it, when it's a really hard knockout like that if part of it is just to shake that and get rid of that loss yeah. like if that becomes the thought like i just gotta wipe this out as opposed to do i feel like this is the right time yeah like i mean if he goes in and looks great 
it's almost like the loss didn't happen, right? It's like just forgot about it. he's in the win column immediately, you know. So I don't know. I, I don't think it's a good idea, personally. And your shirt, what does your shirt mean? <laughs> it's my dad. It is your dad. Faces Jim, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you got, I, I was just because in the press, there was, it was saying that you, you learned a lot of your work ethic from your father who would fight. And uh, and what are the jobs that he have? Uh, he was a strong man. He was a doorman. He was a truck driver. He's an MMA fire. You know, he's he's a, a man of many hats. So he's done it all. And uh it's definitely inspirational to see him because he, he did all these things and put all the work into it. Just seeing how much effort he put into those things is uh, it carried off to me and my brother. Except my brother doesn't uh, work quite as hard. <laughs> yeah. Does it put pressure on you? Like, because your dad, when you look at the things your dad did, they're all like real man activities. Yeah. Fucking truck driver. He, just even <laughs> the things that aren't, it's, it's all shit that a man does. Uh, yeah. Was there any pressure on you growing up, like internally? Like, well, I, I can't paint for a living. I have to do something physical. Uh, no, like, no, he never, never pressured us to do anything. Like, really, just kind of if we wanted to do it, we were always sort of guided into it. And, uh, you know, I'm 29 years old. I can't reverse a truck for shit. So, <laughs> so there's that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I can't either. I'm always fascinated. Does he drive a tractor trailer or was it a smaller box truck? Yeah, probably tractor trailer, yeah. Yeah, I see them in New York all the time. And it's, I, I literally don't know how anybody turns a corner in that fucking thing. I, oh. My dad my dad drove a truck too and he, and he took me in the cab one time. And it's just it's incomprehensible to me how they don't just panic the second there's a traffic <laughs> or a turn on, on, on a, yeah. a highway. That's me and my car. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's not, not your skill set, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, what are you expecting out of Yves Loeb? Um, and again, I, I asked this to John before, and, and as a non-fighter, does it mean anything to you at all that all of his fights, again, he has won all of his fights, all of them have been by decision. Does that tell you anything about his approach as a fighter, the fact that he hasn't uh, knocked anybody out or subbed anybody? Um, does that give you any indication of anything at all or no? Uh, I don't take anything from it. You know, everyone... Everyone in MMA has got the ability to to hurt you, and you know there's so many ways you can get caught. You know we got punches, kicks, you got uh, submissions on the ground. There's so many ways. So no, and he's been finding some top guys, tough guys as well, guys that are hard to finish. But I think he's, he's smart. He's got a smart approach. You know when he needs to, he's happy to run the clock down in control. And but when he works, he works. So uh, I'm sure he's going to be looking to try and get something. You know he's wants to prove this is his this is his big breakthrough. You know. So he wants to prove it and, and come out and probably try his best to get a finish or something. So what about for you, Arn? I mean, does this feel like a big fight? Because it looked to me, I'll be honest with you, from the outside looking in, I think people are as excited about this fight as any other fight on the card, save for maybe the main event, obviously title on the line. But I think people are really pumped up about not only what it means in the division, but I mean, just you two guys coming together, it's a hell of a fight on paper. So, I mean, does this feel like a special moment, an opportunity, a, a chance to right something wrong, or is this just the next assignment for you? Yeah, no, it's, it's a big opportunity. I think it's a big opportunity. Beating this guy, he's got an undefeated record, you know. Not a lot of guys wanted to, to take the fight with him. And, uh, you know, I oblige. I'm, I'm more than happy. And I want to go out there and prove something, you know, take that guy as well and uh, put myself back up there. Put myself just as I'm still here, you know. I'm not I'm not going anywhere. What Was there any hesitation? I mean, when this was the fight that was announced, you say, ah, oh, we... I would kind of need to fall back, get more of a rebuilding type fight or anything, or, or were you excited for the opportunity to face, you know, the undefeated guy? Yeah, no, I was excited. I was excited. Uh, I was annoyed that it was like 16 weeks notice, but it was, uh, I was hoping to fight sooner, but uh, it worked out. The camp was good. It was hard work, but uh, yeah, yeah, I'm happy. And I, and I guess guys do avoid each other, but it doesn't seem like that's that that shouldn't be the mentality anybody has because you're going to have to go through people you don't want to have to deal with. I mean, there's no way you're going to get to the championship yeah. fight and have all perfect stylistic matchups or guys that are ideal for you. You're going to have to go through yeah. a few nightmares. Um, but there are guys that just nobody wants to deal with. Like if you look at the, uh, you know, a, a lower weight division, like Marab is a guy that nobody yes. wants to deal with until they have to because he never gets fucking tired. Like, you know, so I guess there yeah. are those guys. It's a, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a funny thing. It's when I was ranked about 10 to 15, you're always trying to fight whoever you think is the easiest fight above you, right? Like the highest ranked guy that you think you could beat. Like, oh, that guy's number six. I think I beat him. And um, star wise, it matches up. So 
everyone does it everyone does it but then you get to number three four people start saying oh i'm not fighting uh eight nine ten you know what i mean so wait right uh, well you're four and you're fighting he's nine so you but you, yeah uh, yeah for me it's, it's a fight like the rankings are kind of you know they're manipulated by people. it's just whatever it's whatever he's a very good fighter and yeah so I, that's all that matters well, you're saying when you're in the top four, then you start to be a little pickier about who below you you're going to fight. Like, you know what I mean? Because you have a lot more to you. Like, and again, the example I always think of is when Frankie Edgar, uh, was it Max he was supposed to fight? Uh, and then there was the injury he fought Ortega and he lost and he wound up losing his shot at the oh, belt. Yeah. I, I believe that was Max had to step aside. Um, okay. So there's a, a lot to risk when you're in the top three or four. Yeah, yeah. You're already like on the door of that thing, the title, right? So, yeah, yeah. Well, look, uh, Arnold, you're opening up the pay-per-view card. I mean, this is an unbelievable fight. John is right. I mean, this is uh, – you're both such great fighters, and you both fought other great fighters. Mm -hmm. uh, and before I let you go, do, do you watch a lot of tape uh, on Yves Loeb, or are you not a guy who likes a whole lot of uh, tape? You like to let your coaches do it? Yeah, I've, I've watched some, but I, I let my coaches do it. Fraz is uh, one of the best minds in the game. and When he watches the tape, he, he gives me the – stuff to work on and we uh he sees things better than me from the outside have you ever watched too much tape and then found that you were expecting things or almost you you watch so much on your opponent because again I, i've seen it work for guys but then guys expect somebody to do something that they don't do and it can actually yeah. it seems like it can fuck them up a little bit yeah no i actually never i never have really been much of a guy watch too much tape so more like a intuitive you know i'll just rather go in there and feed it out See how it feels. Well, good luck on uh, Saturday, man. Great fight. An amazing, amazing opening uh, to this great card. And, and uh, have a great fight, man. We're, ha we're happy to be, uh, to be watching you. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Right. Thank you, Arnold. Take care. Yeah, his dad is fascinating to me. His dad, uh, it's just like one of those guys that is a fucking, like he just lives in a world that would be so difficult or foreign for me to survive in. He is a character to say the least. He's been it's been fun to see him in the corners. He, he's he's a great guy. Man, listen, this is a big opportunity for Arnold. And, and I kind of hate to to hear it. You know, I was watching some of his media day and stuff, and he's right. He's getting a lot of questions about the loss, but that's understandable, right? It's the first setback in the UFC, and it was to a, a legend, and you kind of wonder where it's going to be in the career. But man, this is right back into another big opportunity. If he wins this, He's right up there at the top of the division. Um, you know, I don't know if, if Mosar has the casual fans interest yet to know how good the guy is. But yeah. I can tell you the hardcores know how good the guy is. I mean, he's been on the radar for a while. So this would be a huge, huge win. And, you know, maybe line up something in the summertime for Arnold. You know, you're, you're talking about maybe some potential big UK shows over there. I mean, you've got Tom Aspinall. you got Leon Edwards, you know, trying to line some things out. And, and, and that would be a big opportunity for Arnold Allen to fight you know, back home in the UK at a big show like that. So th there's a lot on the line. I think it's a big, big fight. And uh, I, I, like I said, I'm as excited for this one as, as anything on the card. Yeah. And, and uh, but you're going to get, like you said, when, when it's a loss to a guy like Max who looked really good and who's been looking great uh, as of late, and it, it is the most recent fight, because if he had knocked Max out in the first round, that's still the thing that people would be asking him about. Um, so, yeah. you know, your most recent fight, if it's noteworthy and not just a decision with a, a, a decent fighter, people are going to ask about um, all right, well, John, listen, do you have any predictions? Who do you think is going to happen between Strickland and Duplessis? Man, I feel like this is two bulls that are just going to go out there and collide in the center of the cage, right? I, I To be honest, uh, you know, I think Drake is Duplessis. I think the power early on, uh, the, what he brings to the table, the aggression, you know, the grappling opportunities, I think is, is going to test Sean. Um, but we've seen how durable Sean is and, and how much he's able to, to, to last through that fire and to press past it and um, you know, I'm interested to see the energy levels in a five round fight. If it goes that far, how does Drickus hold up in that? You know, he's had this surgery that's supposedly helping him breathe better, yeah. you know, helping his conditioning and all that. So I, I really, I, I like the power and the danger of Drickus early. Um, but I, I like Sean as this thing wears on and goes on. So I'm torn. I can really see either possibility happening. Uh, and I'm excited for it. I love fights like that. I know. I, I, I look. Could I see Drake is knocking anyone out? Yeah, of course. I mean, he fucking yep. hits like a, like a truck. But I, I'm going to take uh, Strickland. I think Strickland finds a way to drag him into the later rounds. I think he's smart enough. He's a high enough fight IQ uh, to either uh, tie him up uh, if he's feeling his power, or or to just kind of press him enough where it's hard for him to get off what he wants to. So I think that Strickland will. Uh, I don't think it'll be an easy fight for him at all. But I do think that he winds up with the decision. Um, 
and Pennington, uh, Myra Bueno Silva. We'll just do those two. I'm going to say that uh, I'm going to think that uh, Bueno Silva will. I think she's going to submit her uh, within the first three rounds. I think she subs Raquel. Yeah, I, I think that's a very likely scenario, man. I think she's very dangerous, and she's proven that. She seems to be just getting at a higher level. Um, she seems to be the one in form. Raquel Penning, as tough as they come, we've seen it right. Durable, she's got great boxing. Um, but yeah, I, I like Buena Silva in this fight as well. I can't, can never count Raquel Pennington out of a fight. She's that tough. She's that durable. And, and look, she's got the experience at this level. Like Myra was saying earlier, right? She's never been through the big press conference. She's never right. been through the big ceremonial weigh-ins. And, you know, you say you have all that and you feel confident and then you get there and it's that night and it's that title fight and everything that you thought you knew changes. You know what I mean? Raquel Pennington has been there, done that. So I think she's mentally more prepared to deal with everything that's going to pop up. But I just look at the frame and the grappling skills of Buena Silva, and I favor that. Uh, unless, again, people can freeze up. People can have bad moments. They can have bad nights. Um, and Raquel Penning is capable of beating anybody. So should should be competitive. Um, but I, I like Buena Silva as well. And, I mean, we like storylines and stuff too, right? Yeah. Buena Silva and, and, and Juliana Pena yeah. in Brazil sure would be a lot of fun. That sure would be a lot of fun. Yeah, and I think when you see your face on the poster, and again, she's had a fight night, but this is a major pay per view, and your face is on the poster. Does it uh, does it make you feel more confident? Does it throw you? I guess every fighter reacts a little bit differently. Let me plug the fights before we wrap up. UFC two ninety seven is uh, it's in uh, freezing Toronto uh, this Saturday, the twentieth. The early prelim starts six thirty ESPN Plus and Fight Pass. Uh, the prelims, of course, are eight o'clock. Also ESPN News and ESPN Plus. And the main card's 10 o'clock, ESPN Plus pay-per-view. And uh, just a great, great card. Pollyanna of Vienna against Jillian Robertson starts off the prelims. Um, really, really awesome. And uh, Garrett Armfield against Brad Katona is the, uh, is, is the main fight. I always say main event, the main fight of the prelims. But there's some really good fights. Chris Curtis is fighting on this uh, card. Neil Magny, uh, just an incredible, uh, incredible night. Yeah, it really is. I think there's going to be a lot of fun fights and obviously a big night for Canada. There's a lot of Canadians on there that yeah. want to stand out fighting at home and have some big moments. You know, you look like Mike Malott uh, is in there. Uh, Johan Lioness, Jasmine, Jasmine Divisius. I mean, all of them looking to make statements. So should be a lot of fun. I know like, you know, as we're starting to see this 298, 299, 300 card yeah. come together. I mean, you've got these massive blockbusters coming up. And so you might say, oh, well, this one's not quite a stack, but I think it's going to be a fun night of fight. Great first pay per view of the year for the UFC. Well, and on three hundred, just to, they also obviously Gaethje Holloway for the BMF, Ooh. and uh, another a fight that I'm really happy about. I mean, uh, even though Bobby Green's coming off a, a tough loss to Jalen Turner uh, against uh, Jim Miller. I mean, who the fuck doesn't want to see that fight? I'm happy for Jim Miller that he gets to fight at three hundred because he really wanted that, uh, and he earned it with that last fight. I agree, man. Jim Miller, you know, it's been a conversation point. That man, to me, deserves to be in the UFC Hall of Fame. The type 100%. of longevity, the type of career that he's had. You don't get to do that. You don't get to compete at the highest level for that long and not get some recognition for it. So, yeah, it's crazy. He had been building to UFC 300. He'd been talking about it, you know, for the past couple of years after getting 100 and 200. And then to take a fight three months out from the car just kind of shows you the guy that he is. He's like, well, I mean, I want to be on 300, but I'm a fighter. I fight. That's what I do. Look fantastic in it against Bobby Green, as you said, who, man, Bobby Green is must-see TV. Anytime he's in there, he's going to yeah. he's gonna make it entertaining. So that's a great, great matchup. Um, you know, it does kind of make you wonder what, where that Paul Felder comeback is at. Paul Felder was talking about maybe Jim yeah. Miller. So, you know, is there another fight available? So we'll see. And then, as you said, Justin Gaethje, Max Holloway for the BMF title. I mean, violence, excitement, insanity, two of the most popular guys in the sport today. I mean, that's going to be amazing. And props to Max Holloway for never backing down. To be able to, to move up, yeah. say, I'll move up a weight class and fight a guy that is one of the most violent dudes in the history of sports, yeah. sign me up, takes a special individual. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if Justin can get to his legs. Like, uh, can Justin chop his legs, or is Matt Max able to stay away uh, and avoid that? Because Holloway is just such a smart fighter, and he's just so long, and he's just uh, he's really hard to close distance. So, yeah, I'm, I can't wait for that, but 300 is coming up. Thanks a lot, John. This was a lot of fun. I appreciate you stepping in, and as you said earlier, uh, easily replacing Matt Serra, and you were correct. I appreciate you being here. <laughs> just like I said, <laughs> might as well get rid of that guy, man. Let's do this full time. Thank you very much, buddy, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. And don't forget the fights. This Saturday night, uh, pay-per-view begins at 10 p.m. Thanks, John. Thank you. Take care, guys.